Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. This is Antique Landis. I am chair of ULI Louisiana. Maybe you panelists can give me a thumbs up to let me know that I am audible. Awesome. Thank you, Norman. Um, while people are getting on, just to give you all a quick intro to ULI Louisiana, um, we have as many organizations shifted to an online platform for the time being. Just a little quick bit about ourselves. Um, the ULI Louisiana is made up with all kinds of professionals who touch the built environment. And our mission is to provide leadership in responsible land use and create and sustain thriving communities worldwide. So we are a worldwide organization with a local presence through ULI Louisiana. Um, I'd like to give a quick thank you to our annual sponsors who allow us to do what we do. You see them listed here, and especially during this hard time, we really appreciate their um, booing us up to keep on and provide great content to you. So a little bit about future content that's coming up. We do have some other things coming up very quickly. Um, Urban Plan is one of our community outreach opportunities, and that training is actually tomorrow, so very, very soon. For in more information on that, if you'd like to um, learn more and participate, you can see our website at the bottom, ULI. I'm sorry, louisiana.uli.org. Um, and then beginning a week from today is our book club, which is something that we've been looking to launch for the last few months. And um, we've gotten to partner with ULI Triangle, which is based in North Carolina on this. We will be reading The Color of Law. There will be four sessions. The first is a bit of a launch. And this is gonna be facilitated by Chris Tyson, who is out of Baton Rouge. And Oops, Anita Brown Graham, who is out of North Carolina. So really looking forward to that. Um, the book is great, uh, historical context, and definitely topical to all that is going on right now. We also are still providing information about how to get engaged with ULI, whether you are a new member or an existing member looking to re-engage, and you can participate in our member orientation on that front August 21st. So for more, go to our website. And with that, going to today's event, um, which is about economic development opportunities in Southeast Louisiana. I'm really pleased to be able to, to launch this to our moderator, Peter Raschuti, who is a esteemed clinical professor at the A.B. Freeman School of Business at Tulane. You may also recognize his voice from NPR's Out to Lunch program, um, which is Mondays and Thursdays, and always good entertainment as well as interesting information. Um, you'll notice also that you have a bonus panelist to who you would have seen in the advertisements. We really appreciate Rachel Delamain for joining our other three esteemed panelists. So, Peter, with that, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Anne. We do have a great, great, great panel here. Things are going pretty well. You know, we have a pandemic, record unemployment, and now a a whole lot of dust from the Saharan desert. So things are uh, pretty terrific. But uh, we're going to talk about how we're going to come out the other side of this. And I think that's really the most, uh, most important part. Uh, it, basically, what we're seeing economically and, is that um, people want to know, what is the shape of the recovery going to be? And, and some people think it'll be a V-shaped recovery. In other words, the economy fell off a cliff, and then it's going to bounce right back up again. Uh, there's others that think it'll be more of a U-shaped recovery where we fall off a cliff, kind of flop around for a while, and then gradually go back up. Uh, others fear what could be a W-shaped recovery, which is a big decline, and then a series of increases and decreases as the pandemic kind of reappears and we have to go back into lockdown. Uh, this would be a, a real, really devastating for the business confidence and also uh, consumer confidence. So we'll have to see where that goes. In terms of um, New Orleans, just because I'm over here, is, um, and I know Norman's gonna speak a lot more about all this, but we're, um, we're in a very difficult position because uh, what makes the city tick? Uh, you know, it's, we have the best restaurants in the world. Uh, we have uh, great live music. We have, uh, uh, like all of the state, we have great festivals and such. And these are things you need to do with a lot of people. And so when you look at that and the overall tourism and hospitality, we're really up against the wall a bit here. Uh, one of the things to remember is that after 9-11, it took three years to get air, uh, air traffic back to where it was before 9-11. So the idea of us just bouncing right back immediately doesn't really seem to be in the cards. And of course, the other part is that the, the oil industry, uh, which is very part, important to part of the, uh, part of the state, 
um, is had a difficult time. It's basically been on death's doorstep for the last five years when the Saudis opened the spigots um, uh, in 2014, 2015. And so uh, they've been having a tough time anyway. Now it is very, very difficult there. People are optimistic because the price is back around $40. But what tends to happen is at $40 that West Texas shale oil can start to make money and it starts to produce more and produce more supply and push the price back down. Most people think you need 60 or $70 a barrel to make the Gulf of Mexico uh, viable. So that's kind of where we, uh, where we are right now. And, um, and of course, in terms of transportation and the port um, and all kinds of transportation down here, we're a big transportation state. Uh, when you look at South Louisiana with the largest port in the world, um, that is uh, very, very sensitive to all the tariffs that have been put on and some new tariffs that were put on again today. So uh, not, a, not an easy, uh, easy grind, but as, um, as the mayor of Chicago once said, uh, uh, talking about how you have to do good things in bad times, he said, you know, a disaster is a terrible thing to waste. So I think that's what we ought to, ought to be looking on right now. And, and each of our four panelists are terrific. We've been, we talked yesterday about what this was going to be like. And I think you're in for a, um, a real treat. Um, I don't know what order we ought to try this in, but I think um, I'm going to start with Rachel uh, Delamain. And she is from the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. And um, Rachel, how's it going over there? Hi, I'm so glad to be with you. Thanks for having me today. Yes, I am with the Baton Rouge Area Chamber and work on the business development team. That is the economic development arm of the chamber. Um, we're a nine parish region and work with all of our parish partners. Um, super excited to be here and we've got a lot of good stuff going on in our region right now. A lot of activity. It's just like you mentioned, big transportation uh, state and we've got, we've got a lot of logistics right going on, um, new projects projects looking at us. Um, but we've got a super healthy pipeline right now and we're just excited about everything coming up. That is, uh, that is good, good to hear. So kind of the industries that are uh, particularly strong are the ones in your nine parish area when you think of what chemical companies and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, there's a um, well, that's good. That's great, we, Rachel. We, we've taken, we took a big pivot, of course, with the pandemic, as you know. We came out of 2019 with, um, gosh, it's like I've been with BRAC for 14 years now, and I think we won 27 projects um, between new and expanding companies in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we came off this big wave and, you know, still have this very healthy pipeline that I'll get into uh, further into the conversation. But, um, you know, all the strategic plans went out the window as soon as, as COVID hit, right? So um, all those great plans are put to rest and um, we responded and our initial responses were to, you know, our business community um, and the community itself. You know, we did the PPE, PPP donation center um, and set that up and BR works and we're connecting, you know, employers that are laying employees off with people that need jobs. Um, we set up an entire warehouse for the PPP. Um, we've been doing webinars on all the loans and different topics. So we've really been, you know, very strong, I would say, an asset for our region during this, this pandemic. And with you, pipeline is not a metaphor. It's a, you have real pipelines, which is, uh, it's, uh, they, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Abadie from Sterling, uh, Sterling Properties. I'm fascinated to have you here because you see uh, a little broader geographic area than, than the rest of us. Yeah, I do. I mean, we, we actually cover the entire states of Louisiana, Mississippi, um, most of Alabama and the Florida panhandle. So when I look at things, I look at the I-10 and the I-20 corridor for the most part in terms of economic development and, and, and engines that drive business. And, um, and you know, I, I think I've been fortunate enough and, and unfortunate enough to throughout this, the, the shutdowns from the pandemic to be able to um, really do some research and really do a lot of, uh, you know, learning during this period of time since transactions have slowed down. And what's, what has come out of that, I think, is I, I have a good grasp of, of what we're seeing now, what is probably coming, and then what the physical characteristics of the geography in which we operate um, would be able to, you know, what things could be supported based on what I'm, I'm seeing nationally and internationally. So, um, when you talk about the segments of commercial real estate, you know, you look at, you know, the, the most affected has been the hospitality sector, you know, obviously, and, and what are we expecting in the future in the hospitality sector? And this is, this is kind of blanket across all of our properties. The luxury brand hotels are the ones that are the most hurt right now. 
if you think about it, those are the ones that have the high touch, um, you know, services that they offer to their clients. And those are the things that you, you, you just can't do right now. The, 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 the ones that are doing better right now are the more of the roadside motels or the, the driving motels and then the extended stay motels. And then you look at retail. You know, obviously retail has been extremely affected and, and I still don't think we've seen the, the full effect of um, what's going to happen in retail because as this goes on and time goes on, if you think about it from the perspective of a retailer or a restaurant, you know, if, if they're operating at a loss right now, a, a marginal loss and that continues, they're going to have to close at some point. So we're, we're still seeing the shakeout in retail. Um, you know, office has been relatively stable so far. Uh, even though there are, you know, we can get into if, if anybody has any questions about shifts in office as it relates to the different markets. And then, you know, industrial. Um, industrial is a broad category. You know, it includes everything from logistics, like Rachel was saying, to, you know, big manufacturing facilities. And so there are specific characteristics that relate to that as well that we can talk about in terms of, of what I feel is going to be the impact across the, the geography. But if you look at the logistics segment, you know, a good rule of thumb is just look at there are different ways to look at it, both from the from the port side and then from the um, you know the last mile, you know the inventory control side. And if you look at at locations across our state, that you can go north, south, east, or west. So Slidell, Hammond, you know even Baton Rouge, you know Lafayette, Lake Charles, those are the ones that likely would you'd see more of these um, smaller distribution centers um, being able to access. And then of course we can talk about other things as well if anybody has any questions. And then finally multifamily and Multifamily across the state and across the United States has maintained their um, their their collections throughout this time. Part of that has been pop, propped up by the you know the um, the CARES Act, and so really multifamily. We're going to find out what's going to happen in multifamily kind of at the end of July, going in August and September, uh, as long as there as long as no additional stimulus has been re, you know released by the federal government. So. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, um, you know, and I'm not going to talk too much about Jefferson, you know, Baton Rouge or New Orleans, because we have people on here that can talk about those. But as it relates to the western side of the of the state, I do think we have some opportunity there um, as well. And Chris, when you when you talk about uh, office and multifamily and all, it's um, I guess it's kind of tough right now because you don't have these. You haven't seen what the renewals look like now. Is that right? Is that, yeah. So in in. In office, most of, if you think about it, a lot of the leases are, are very long-term leases. So if you have a corporate office somewhere in downtown New Orleans, you know um, your thought process is going to be very different than if you have a garden office somewhere in Baton Rouge. Um, you know, in terms of of safety for your clients and your and and for your employees, um, and those long-term leases in the in the bigger buildings are the ones that you can't that don't turn over as quickly, so they're harder to renew or harder to deal with in in an instance like this. So you'll see some stability in the office market, especially in the downtown office market, you know, that, that may turn over over time. It's just, it's going to be interesting to find out long-term what the ramifications are. And the, the idea, what, what we're expecting is, you know, they're going to maintain the, the, the larger office environment in the downtown areas, but also maybe have a smaller presence in the suburbs where they can control the environment more, where people might work two days a week instead of working from their house. Um, where they wouldn't go downtown every day, but they also wouldn't stay home every day. And, and so, you know, and then in hospitality, it's, you know, it's, it's a crapshoot right now. And, and I say that, and hospitality is one of the darlings of the industry right now. But um, one thing that was pointed out in a previous webinar that I was on was that uh, we haven't seen the effect of the 2019 graduates that went into the workforce that now have lost their jobs and they're being propped up by the, by the stimulus. You know, what's going to happen in two months to them? Are they going to move back home with their parents? And then the 2020 graduates that just graduated, they don't have jobs. Those are the, those are the ones that fuel the bottom segment of the multifamily sector. So, um, you know, those are just two good points for us to watch over the next few months. Mm. Very good. And, and Norman uh, Barnum uh, is here. Of course, he's with the New Orleans Business Alliance, and he's in the same town I am here. Uh, you, see things, uh, you see things that the average person wouldn't see, Norman. What, do you, what are you seeing? I'll tell you, uh, all of the panelists have helped frame uh, the reality in Orleans Parish uh, specific. Peter, you did a great job of uh, the challenges that we have. Listen, restaurant, hospitality, the linchpins of, uh, that drive the experience economy, we're, we're suffering. And what we're seeing now is the interplay of really human behavior as it's going to impact our market and our economy. 
And I think uh, with the uh, mayor's designation today relative to uh, mandating masks in public, this is the first time that we're really seeing the impact of uh, each one of the citizens directly impacting the ability for our economy to reopen in a different way. And so um, my challenge has been driving economic development, utilizing the tools of data, data analysis, uh, how that will impact uh, our market consumption and liquidity. And those dynamics are all variable now and a lot depends upon human behavior. And, and I think that is the biggest thing for me. How can I, uh, to your point, Peter, extrapolate when will we make the, current, the turn and when will we be able to get the economy going? And so what I did is I went back to the pandemic of uh, 2018 through 2020 myself. And we are paralleling a lot of the same human behaviors from that time to here. Technology has changed. Products have changed, distribution has changed, but human behavior has been the same. So for me, um, how can we extrapolate uh, the potential of everybody doing what is correct for phase three and then extrapolate, extrapolate that over 18 to 36 month period and see what does that do by industry sector in order to be specific. Uh, so that's been the challenge that uh, we have before us. Uh, there's some tools that um, I'm starting to utilize along with uh, Buxton, which is our data analytics provider, to see what are going to be the consumer behaviors post-COVID and how will that impact the models of uh, the restaurant, hospitality industry. We all know deals have to cash flow and how will they cash flow based upon these new set of behaviors. So interesting times. I, I, I'm sitting on webinars and looking to get a feedback from all parties to see how we actually move to the other side of this because it is uncharted. Uh, thank you, Norman. It's, uh, it's, it certainly is. Now, you and I have to go buy a lot more masks. Yes, we do. Um, I think one of the things to where we're at right now, we're still in the dealing with the first phase of recovery, meaning we're dealing with masks, a discipline, supply chain, issues that are still dealing with the pandemic itself. The moving to reopening and pivot to the reopening and getting everybody on level ground for the reopening, that's our challenge. But when the fall comes and hopefully we will open the school timely, then that pivot is gonna to be to 50% occupancy, 75% occupancy, what that, that does for the jobs, that can still be saved. Uh, liquidity instruments, as uh, Rachel uh, uh, spoke to, PPP, idle, but there may be other instruments, capital instruments, that uh, entrepreneurs are gonna need to get to the other side. And quite frankly, they don't need additional debt. So what are gonna be the instruments that are gonna help them get to that point? Or what are gonna be the programs that Congress, or either at the state, or federal, state, or local level to incentivize the performance that's going to be required to keep the jobs created and retained. So great challenges in front of us, but most to your point, with this chaos comes the greatest opportunity for our city. If we figure this out, we'll, we're, we are a linchpin. And I have reached back to uh, entrepreneurs in Japan uh, and China to see how they reopen their economies, their restaurants, they've been through it. We haven't, they've done this twice. And so a lot of this is gonna come back to the discipline of uh, the individuals on how we can get to the finish line. Thank you, and our, and our last panelist, but not last for any apparent reason, Jerry. This, uh, in fact, we're the only other Italian guy on this uh, on the panel here. Uh, Jerry Bologna from uh, Jedco. What, what do you see, you see you're, um, you look at things a little bit differently than the other panelists. Um, what are you seeing? Well, uh, Peter, thanks, uh, thanks for having us. And um, we certainly, it's well documented, the industries that have suffered in this region, such as hospitality. Uh, I think one that, that we haven't really spoken about in, in this realm is our healthcare industry. Uh, because 
destination healthcare is a significant contributor in the New Orleans region uh, with so many people coming to Oshner and LCMC for their, their healthcare. And that has really been sidelined as people have e either not been able to access healthcare because they've been treating only COVID patients or you have the fear factor of people holding off on elective procedures and, and things like that. So that's, that's certainly been one of the areas we've seen uh, impacted uh, in our area. Um, but, but really in Jefferson, while we've been dealing with the acute nature of, of dealing with the closures and the stay at home orders and getting businesses what they need, uh, we've been surprised, I think, by the level of activity in terms of prospects that were either looking pre-COVID uh, or have emerged uh, post-COVID. Uh, they've continued to show interest. Uh, we see some real opportunities in reshoring of operations, uh, whether it be on the manufacturing side and perhaps this push to uh, manufacture in the United States, uh, but also the reshoring of of uh, call centers or back office operations. And um, we, you know, we have uh, an example we're dealing with right now where, um, you know, employees were offshore to um, India. And as they have dealt with a worldwide pandemic and have had stay at home orders, they don't have the infrastructure to work remotely uh, and to shift those operations to homes like, like we have here. So with those lack of redundancies, uh, we've had some operations express an interest in reshoring those call centers back, uh, back here locally, and, and we hope to have some announcements here uh, in the next couple of weeks on that front. But uh, really, uh, from our perspective in Jefferson, we've been tracking the tax revenue numbers. Uh, the June tax distributions, which were actually the, um, the April collections, we were down 18% which is a precipitous drop, but I don't think it was as catastrophic as, as many people had thought it would be. Uh, we'll continue to monitor you know, future months, but I uh, think certainly you've seen with contactless delivery, uh, the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world have, have continued to thrive and, and generate those, those tax dollars. But uh, we really are gonna place our focus on, on our small businesses in Jefferson that have uh, borne the brunt, I think, of this uh, stay-at-home order and, and closures, and those are the ones that have been probably most adversely uh, impacted through this. So we're actually at a unique time in, in, in our position at JEDCO in that we are embarking on a new long-term economic development strategic plan. And um, while we thought maybe we sidelined that to get through COVID, uh, we actually rethought it and this is the ideal time because uh, we can not only plan for the long term but also incorporate some of the strategies for not only recovery but some of the other uh, some of the other issues that have emerged at this time the equity and inclusion piece for example is is uh, an area that we we now have an opportunity to incorporate that in uh, into our long-term efforts mm -hmm. Jerry you touched on something that I thought was it, most people aren't talking about it, but it's a big deal, is these corporations and their supply chains. They, uh, before, I'd say for the last 40 years, all they cared about was lowest cost. And if you had a, a widget that had to come from South Korea, well, that was, as long as it saved you a few pennies. But now, companies seem to have been shifted and want to care about resilience. Uh, what do you think that means? Uh, Jerry, do you think that means more manufacturing here or uh, uh, distribution centers? Yeah, I, th I mean, I certainly think it, it means more manufacturing here, whether that remains a long-term play or if it's a sort of a short-term reaction uh, remains to be seen. But I think we have a lot of opportunities in this state with our workforce and with our intermodal access with the river and rail and, and everything we have in this area, uh, certainly a lot of opportunities uh, on that. But, but I think, you know, we saw this a little bit um, well, we saw it on a grand scale after Hurricane Katrina, just companies learning to, to operate leaner and meaner. And, um, and I think we're gonna see a second wave of that here as, as people have had to downsize or right, right size, they're gonna learn how to operate that way and they're, they're gonna try and adapt uh, as such. 
you know, one thing is that my students at Tulane, they, they follow the Louisiana companies and it wouldn't be surprising to you to tell you which two companies have done best in here. And that is uh, the stock of Waiter, which is, you know, they were having a very tough time, but right. now everybody wants to deliver. And then um, LHC Group and Emeticis, the uh, two home healthcare companies that are headquartered. So, you know, oil companies, not so hot, the retailers, but just the way you, you think in here. And Rachel, um, you're, you're in these conversation. What's it like to be pitching your region to big corporations? Are they, I guess what I would think is that they're, they're very tuned in, they wanna hear about it, but they're a little, little uh, shy to pull the trigger? Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, with the petrochemical industry and everything going on, cash is king, right? So they're gonna likely hold on to their cash right now make a pause that may be a two month pause that may be a two year pause we really don't that's yet to be seen um but on the logistics front um we are seeing a lot of um, distribution projects a lot of warehousing um people looking to get their product whether that's last mile to reshoring it was just like we were mentioning but we still we still have a ton of manufacturing i was just checking out our pipeline actually and we have got a ton of a-class manufacturing i would say we have 15 what we call 90 percentile is likely going to announce we have 15 projects right now um, with a total of uh, 2,500 jobs plus um, that we still highly confident that these projects will announce. So we have, we have been um, fortunate that, that we have, you know, closings on properties. We've got um, properties under construction um, and hopefully we'll be having um, announcements coming in the next couple of months. So we are, we are staying busy. Um, Maybe I'm just a total optimist, but we really still have, I mean, I, I've gotten a call yesterday morning about a new lead for a durable goods product. So mm -hmm. um, we, we've got some good stuff going on in Baton Rouge right now. And case. Rachel, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm impressed about is that you're still pushing forward and pitching and uh, looking for new customers. So many times in a, in a difficult period like this, people tend to like hide or just kind of, kind of stop the operation. But uh, what we found historically is those that keep, pushing through the rough periods come out further ahead on the other side, so. Yes, thank you. No, Adam Knapp is a wonderful, bold leader, um, and he's got a great plan put together, and so we're excited about that. Yeah, we've all just continued to push forward. I've been on the phone with site selection consultants, you know, make, keeping those relationships and listening to them and what's going on and what their forecasting is to come. You know, a lot of them see that um, they believe that we will be stronger. I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote the quote down, forecasting over the next two to three years will be stronger today than it was in January of 2020. So um, prior to the pandemic. So, we, you know, we're excited about that and we're very hopeful. And, and Chris, you had mentioned uh, um, retailing and offices and people are really wondering there because let's face it, we were overstored anyway, uh, kind of coming into this, most people thought. And then the other part is with the offices, you know, you've got people uh, I, I think the legacy from COVID will be that more and more people will work remotely. Up until now, if, if John was at home working, the theory was that he was just goofing off at home. And, uh, and now, you know, it's proved that it, it hasn't. What do you think, what about reusing spaces of offices and retailing? Is that kind of a, uh, something that's spin around in people's minds? No, oh, absolutely. And, and first, first, I'd like to make one comment as it relates to uh, remote working. Um, we're starting to see data now come out that that says that um, you know different surveys of different people in different age groups as to you know who wants to work remotely and who wants to be in the office. And counter to our initial thought process, um, the highest concentration of people that want to be back in the office is actually the millennials and Gen X. So it's the younger people who who there are more of them in the workforce and they want to be in the office. The ones that want to work remotely more often are actually the higher level employees that have been there a longer period of time, which you know, would indicate to me that there's, you know, at the end of the day, we may not see that much of a, of a, of a net effect of, of less office space at the end of the day. And um, you know, it may be used less, but it may not be the net effect. And then- For the record, I, think, I would have thought just the opposite, by the way. Everybody, every, I think everybody did. Yeah. You know, and, and this is coming from CBRE and JLL and you know, um, you know, even Walker and Dunlop mentioned something about it today, I think on one of the calls. And so, um, so it, it, these are these are qualified sources to be able to provide that information. And 
Um, and, and as it relates to adaptive reuse, especially of retail space, which a lot of people are talking about now, you know, how do you use, you know, we have, and, and look, we could talk all day about this, so, but I'll try to synopsize it a little bit. You know, if we're looking at dark boxes and, and how, can, how they can be used as fulfillment centers, there's, there's some opportunity there. Um, we have seven feet of seven square feet of retail uh, per capita in the United States versus we have, we have, you know, we have seven times the square footage of retail per capita in the United States than they do in Europe. So we, we, we are over retail in the United States. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not even a debate anymore. Um, you know, so some of that will get absorbed from adaptive reuses for call centers and different things like that. Um, there are issues in ongoing shopping centers with that co-tenancy requirements um, you know, REA requirements and, and operating agreements with other tenants in the shopping center uh, that we have to overcome. But, you know, those negotiations and those, those conversations are starting to happen, and happen with the existing retailers. So you will see some of that. You'll also see a, a big change in retail in terms of uh, how much space is dedicated to fulfillment. And fulfillment space is probably going to be at the front of the store, not the back of the store like it traditionally was. Um, so you, you will see some changes there. Uh, as it relates to that as well, you'll probably see smaller footprints going forward for new deals for retailers. Nobody's really talking about new deals other than, you know, some restaurants and auto parts stores today. But, uh, you know, so you'll see a different model. Um, you know, it's, it's how to get the, the goods to the consumer in any way the consumer wants it, because that's what we're demanding as the consumer today. So uh, retail is being rethought. This, this is not anything new. It's just accelerated the curve significantly by years. So. I, I do expect to see some adaptive reuse of those of those uh, dark retail spaces. That's great. And, and Norman, before this all happened, um, if I were to go to a cocktail party or a crawfish boil with business folks, the what kept coming up more than anything else is the talk of opportunity zones. Uh, has this derailed opportunity zones? What's happened? No, I, I'll tell you. It's interesting. I, I think uh, Jerry stated it. We still haven't deal flow. Now, the deals have changed. Uh, well, a lot was uh, hotels initially. And uh, well, of course, in Orleans Parish specific, uh, not so much right now. But the pivot to uh, manufacturing and distribution, because of our lo logistics and the connection to the port, we've been approached and have been a, because of these, our zones are so varied in Orleans Parish, we have 25 different ones. We've been approached uh, relative to some of the land uh, in our New Orleans East Opportunity Zones, and in conjunction, quite frankly, with the ports uh, move to uh, Inner Harbor and uh, their strategy, that is picking up momentum. And so that's one area where the shift is occurring, is now it's trying to make sure that we have the industry alignment for uh, the zones. So uh, I can tell you that, yeah, the conversation is much different than I was having in February, relative to Opportunity Zones, uh, manufacturing distribution was not on the list, uh, but it, it, it hit the list very quickly. Uh, and I do think as part of the uh, pivot towards uh, resilience and the supply chain, and what, uh, how can we get more bang for our port? Uh, the port is a major uh, thoroughfare, but uh, over 70% of the port's activity moves right up river. It does not stay here, we do not plan it. And so I've been at uh, uh, Rachel's uh, presentation. Uh, I definitely want to uh, circle back with her because I do know that during New Orleans East and our industrial canal, uh, some levels of activity that have been picked up. Uh, the issue of vertical farming, urban farming and some of those areas has picked up. And uh, quite frankly, um, I couldn't imagine that in January. So it has been significant. And uh, one of the things about marine transportation is uh, all these studies show it, it's the most efficient way to move things. Uh, you know, it's uh, by barge and such, it's a mm -hmm. fraction of the cost of trucking and rail. So uh, thank God we have that, that they gave us that river. That's yeah. <laughs> it's very nice of that they, yeah. uh, Jerry, um, I'll pose this to you, but I think it's gonna go across the, across the whole board here. We can't agree on anything politically in the United States. I mean, we can't even agree on masks, but the one thing we agree on is a huge need for infrastructure. Um, do you think we get it and where is it most needed? Um, well, infrastructure, we, we've been across the state and I know Rachel has been on some of these calls, but um, we certainly anticipate infrastructure being part of a future uh, federal bill. 
And as a state, we've, we've been meeting to talk about our priorities for different regions so that we're, we're ready to promote uh, some of those infrastructure needs. But you can almost uh, break those down into different areas because, of course, we acknowledge, especially with, with um, a state like ours where so much commerce comes through, there's the need for roads and bridges. Uh, but also things like um, uh, Wi-Fi ac broadband access. Um, and we saw that uh, really rear its head with the stay at home order through the education system. And so many students that, that weren't able to, uh, to learn remotely. The, the schools and the systems were able to supply uh, notebooks or iPads or whatever, tablets, but uh, many of the students didn't have access to Wi-Fi at home. So, uh, that's another significant infrastructure uh, issue that has really garnered statewide attention. Uh, there's a statewide push, and actually on the federal level, there's some, some legislation uh, pushing for that educational piece. But um, we, we really, I think every parish has their infrastructure wish list. Everybody has that uh, kind of prioritized list, and mm -hmm. uh, we just want to be positioned to, to take advantage of that. Um, you know, uh, so many of what we, we drive over and everything was all built during the WPA in the, the 30s. I mean, we, this, yeah. is a, this is not optional. So, uh, and um, Norman, one of the things that uh, came out, the mayor mentioned it, and uh, was kind of changing, using this to really rethink cities. Like one of the things that came out was maybe we shouldn't be driving in the French Quarter. Maybe mm -hmm. those ought to be more outdoor cafes or, or things. What, what, do you think things like that are going to be occurring? I will tell you this, I don't think we should lose this opportunity to rethink and reimagine how we go about uh, commerce in Orleans Parish. And, and for sure that once uh, the thought of uh, closing down into traffic and reimagining what that could look like, I think when we go down that road, it may expand our ability to grow hospitality. And uh, I think that's the, the, the biggest point that I'm seeing in this particular period of time. Um, this is a reboot. And when you reboot, you may not come back up the same way that you left. And that might be a good thing. And so I, I don't want to miss this opportunity to uh, look forward at how we can reimagine our space, uh, how we uh, put a metric to the reimagined space, uh, sales tax collection is vital in Orleans Parish, a third of our uh, operating budget. And I did think that it would be easier for um, the population and our citizens to say, if we reimagine this way, this is the outcome that we could possibly get. Uh, I think we've already seen the reduced uh, pollution, uh, more cleanliness in the quarters. There's some positives that may come through that that we need to fully explore. So. I've been, I've been engaged and enthused by the possibilities, but I think we need to be able to validate them in a way that is transparent. And um, folks, change is always difficult, but change with an upside that is verifiable will get the buy-in. And I think that's the most important piece as we move through the, the, the process of change. Chris, on the, on the, on the tough part of the business, um, you take retailing, for example, what is it like to kind of re, be renegotiating leases and such for these folks that can't pay it? I mean, how does it start? Um, what are the keys to getting both parties to uh, get together on that? You know, it, it's difficult. Um, it, it is very difficult right now. And so um, a lot of landlords nationally are offering deferrals to their tenants, you know, mostly not, not a lot longer than 90 days for the most part. Um, the, the trick there is, though, that, you know, every commercial property, you know, in essence, theoretically, every commercial property has debt on it, and you still have to make that debt payment to the lender. So the, the real key in the, in the ownership space is right now is, is dealing with the lenders and what type of debt do you have on that property um, and, and how much can you really even offer to the tenant? Um, you know, we, we're becoming closer to our tenants. One good offshoot to this, if there is anything, is the communication, the increased communication. I mean, obviously, you know, we're having Zoom calls today. We wouldn't be able to have this call today if we didn't have this technology. But also we're having increased communication with our tenants and, and they're telling us more about their business model and what they do and, and how they do it and what their needs are. And we're telling them more about what our needs are from, from that perspective in terms of, of the lending environment. Um, you know, and, and so it's, 
it's a difficult and tenuous situation right now. And we can see a lot of stress, especially in the retail sector, if some relief is not given. ICSE yesterday, um, I, don't, I don't know if this has been published or not, but you know, we're, we're finally, on Capitol Hill, we're finally making some headway in terms of, of getting recognition that um, you know, there may need to be some kind of relief to, uh, to bridge this gap with, between the lenders and the property owners. So we don't have just this glut of properties that goes back into special servicing and, and, and you know, eventually goes back to the lenders. Um, that being said, I, I do think that there's going to be some opportunity there and, and there will be an uptick in, uh, in properties that, that become distressed and, and, and some opportunity and a significant amount of properties that become distressed over the next six months. So, um, but another, another topic as it relates to this is, you know, if retail's closed and, and Norman talked about it, you know, 33% of their revenue comes from sales tax revenue. You know, if, if a, a retailer closes, you're not collecting sales tax revenue anymore. And if you turn it into a call center, you're still not collecting real sales tax revenue. Right. So that's another issue that's coming down the line that we're going to have to, to worry right. about in terms of uh, fund, funding our public entities going forward. And I don't think there's a resolution to it today. Hopefully we'll get some relief on the lending side and, and um, that'll help us in turn be able to, I say us, that'll help property owners in turn be able to work with their tenants. Um, but, but it really is needed. Um, all the stimulus so far has been related mostly to jobs and housing. Um, and, and, you know, so if you think about it theoretically, a property owner is not a company that has employees and doesn't necessarily, you know, house anybody. <laughs> so it's, there's, there's no stimulus that's been out there so far. And, and Chris, is there a difference between uh, negotiating with a, uh, a franchise with a, a national parent versus the, the mom and pop? Sure, and and well, even a, even not just a franchise, but a, a company-owned store like a you know TJ Maxx or something. There's a difference in negotiating with them. You know, in some ways, it's easier to deal with the national retailers, and uh, but in a lot of ways, we, you know, we we work with the local tenants more. You know, and in early in this process, we actually get put together a sheet and, and said, okay. When they came to us and they said, you know, we need some relief. And we said, okay, well, what does that relief look like? Have you looked at these resources? And that, we actually helped them, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases to introduce them to banks and different things to get some PPP funding. Um, you know, we suggested to them if it was a franchise driven model, you know, that they go to their franchisor and say, okay, what's your franchisor going to do? For we'll do something for you as a landlord, but we want to know what the franchisor is going to do as well. You know, will they defer their franchise fees for 90 days or whatever it's going to be? So, um, I, I think we've helped to actually, um, and again, that increased communication has been great, but I think we've actually helped to, um, to help them be more comfortable in the situation they're in. Because for all of us today, it's information. The more information we have, the more comfortable we get. You know, if it's positive information or negative information, we just need to know it and understand it so we understand where we're going better. It doesn't mean it's going to be great at the end, but, mm -hmm. you know, that confidence makes us feel more comfortable in the situation. So um, we've worked with all of our tenants to do that. And you talked about, you know, the debt. It's funny when things are good, uh, doesn't look bad to have a lot of debt on the, uh, on the balance sheet. And then uh, things that, you know, Warren Buffett always said, and I always got a kick out of this. He said, uh, uh, it really is very analogous is that um, you don't know who's been swimming naked till the tide goes out. And that really is very true. I mean, and that's a good example of debt. They, uh, um, you know, um, Rachel, I wanted to ask you, not only have you had a lot of success, but I want to say, if you were talking to other parts of the state, um, what do you think you would tell them? Now, you have the advantage of your in, the kind of industry you attract is, is hanging in there pretty well. But what do you pitch? Do you pitch uh, specifically for what that company needs? Or is there something about that nine parish area where you, you just have, um, you just have a, a, a ticking list there that you know yes. is, your, is your best points? Yes. So it, of course, it depends on who we're talking to and who the prospect is. But, you know, we are the capital city. We're the seat of government right here. Um, that's a large part of our workforce. Um, but we've also got LSU, you know, the flagship university right here in our backyard where you can come here and get a great workforce. And then you've got an exceptional workforce training program called Fast Start that's run out of Louisiana Economic Development Department. They do a fantastic job. And we're a low cost place to do business. Um, and you connect those dots with the Port of Greater Baton Rouge, you, you know, with I-10 and um, your know, three tier one class railroads, you're, we're, we sit in a very good position. And Rachel, I have to ask you because people ask me this all the time. You, you provide a good opportunity, a company comes in, 
you give them say 10 years with no taxes and then after 10 years and one day they leave. I mean, what is it you need to do so that that doesn't happen? Well, and I can't say that that's necessarily a fair statement that people walk away after they make that, you know, a company comes in, they invest a ton of time to find the right location. They logistically know it's going to work. They've already done the due diligence on their cost of business model. Um, you know, most of these operations are set up to run, you know, 30 to 50 years. So, you know, I think the incentives help us remain competitive against places that are very close to us that could just as equally be a good place to do business. Um, and so all of those things, you know, kind of come into play, but incentives are an important part of the process. Um, and it's important for us to remain competitive. And I want to tell you, cause I should have said this in the beginning is uh, on the education side of uh, <laughs> Tulane is opening. We're going to open a few days early and we're going to at Thanksgiving, we're going to send them home for good. I'm uh, not for good for the end of the semester. That would sound bad. And, uh, <laughs> They don't come back after Thanksgiving. And, um, and so we're trying to figure out, like everyone else, you know, education has been, it, I mean, this is a terrible thing for me to say, but it, nothing's changed in 200 years. You know, it really has, where everybody else has had these evolutions, it's still this sage on the stage and such. So I think we're about to go through, a, you know, hit a wall and have to do a lot of innovation uh, ourselves. You know, they've, they've told us for the fall to be able to teach in person, uh, online on something like this and then something called HyFlex where they put a, a camera on the ceiling that follows the professor around and it streams live. So, um, you know, you're not alone. Everybody's trying to figure this out. If, and if you don't have those things, and um, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it, you're sort of the University of Phoenix, you know, if you're just watching a television screen all the time and nothing against the University of Phoenix, but, you know, universities charge a lot more than that. So, uh, and God knows if we'll be able to show them football. That's what I do. <laughs> That's the one thing we, uh, we don't know. Uh, Norman, you're in, involved in everything. We're going to have uh, fans in the Superdome? Wow. That, that's, that's the million dollar one. I will tell you that uh, if we uh, adhere to the social distancing guidelines, we comply with the mask, our probability of having, I think at last point, at least 30% of the dome occupied with the game is, is better than not. Uh, I also think that the confluence of the National Football League and the, the quite frankly, the need to have and, uh, and programming are going to drive some of the decision also. Uh, in Orleans Parish, that is the largest potential still ongoing event that has not been canceled, uh, a Saints football game. And so, uh, like all of us, it's to be determined. There's still uh, assessing the data. The more likely is if the NFL goes through the camps and they are able to move past uh, all of the challenges of the pandemic, the closer we get to uh, September or preseason and we're still meeting some of the, the guidelines, I, I would say, yes, we're going to have it. Uh, but here, and I think we, we touched on it, the need for um, the, the revenue that is generated from the event the jobs that are uh, generated from actual having an event there. That's going to be crucial. And um, how we navigate, how we thread that needle every week that we assess and change our human behavior increases our likelihood that we could actually get there. So I, I'm, I keep my head down. I'm prayerful that we will finish June strong. We will finish July and get to a point where we have phase three. And then with greater confidence, we will be able to say, yes, there will be a Saints game. Because quite frankly, we're dealing in uncertainty. And uh, the market and, and comfort uh, is what we're trying to get to. And there's some variables out here relative to a vaccine, uh, improved social distancing, and school opening. Those are a couple of things that outside of the Saints game, that if those things occur, the likelihood of the Saints is greater. And Rachel, people would just roll over and die in Baton Rouge if they couldn't go to an LSU football game, right? I mean, that would be... I've been on a, a lot of the resilient um, commission meetings, if you can imagine, Louisiana resilient meetings. And, um, you know, one of the first things that, that opened up in recreation was kids softball and baseball and, you know, um, youth, youth sports. 
So, um, of course, okay. all the LSU Tigers cannot imagine a fall without LSU. <laughs> and you got to get the kids out of the house. You can't take it anymore. I'm with Norman. You know, we, we need to see good predictability ahead before we can, you know, implement those kind of things because everybody's health and safety is the most important mm -hmm. thing. Um, and only we can help control that right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jerry, I wanted to ask you about uh, people, uh, cities have been, well, first of all, let me just, let's start with that. Cities uh, were really moving forward. It was, uh, people wanted to be in the city. Uh, my young people at, at Tulane, I mean, that's where they want to live. If you look at New Orleans, they want to live uh, uptown, the French Quarter, Marigny, um, uh, the Bywater. And, and, and really, the, this generation, the idea, uh, living in a cul-de-sac and commuting to an office park is like their idea of hell, you know? So um, do you think that ends because of this? Uh, do you think that's uh, that momentum is, has stopped, uh, Jerry? Well, I think that that trend is certainly one that wasn't just taking place in the New Orleans region. That's a, was across America. Was that sort of um, flight back into the city core, that desire for the walkability and and that that type of of lifestyle? Um, there have been a number of articles published recently that have indicated that suburbs, those first ring suburbs could thrive again as people seek a less dense uh, area once again. And um, I say that sort of tongue in cheek because we still, there's a lot of people in Jefferson Parish that still think we're less dense and, and uh, a bedroom community, but we're every bit as urban uh, as, as, any other, uh, as any other city. But I think the suburbs, especially those first ring suburbs, um, will start to see some increases in, uh, in desirability, not, not only related to COVID and, and the desire to be less dense, but that population uh, is beginning to have children. Uh, that age group population is beginning to have families and um, in many instances in communities across the country, they're gonna, they're, they're now starting to have some of the desires that they're maybe their parents or their grandparents had to for a lawn and, and playgrounds and, and things that, that might not be um, available in, in the city core. So I think that's something that uh, we've actually taken a really strong look at in Jefferson. In fact, our housing stock is one of the things we've, we've placed a real focus on. Um, in Jefferson, as you know, all, all of our housing stock uh, is predominantly post-World War II construction, it's not desirable. It's not what people are, are desiring these days. And we've, uh, we've had a number of efforts and, and we were actually launching a pilot program in Terrytown, uh, just across the river and, and outside of the, the city limits of Gretna where I think people are realizing that it's probably the closest you can get to downtown New Orleans without being in, uh, in downtown New Orleans. Um, yet it, it, it has that, uh, uh, suburban uh, suburban feel so we're we're doing a, a pilot program where we're building uh, actually in conjunction with Tulane uh, School of Architecture um, building some pilot homes in Terrytown that keep the character of the neighborhood yet include the modern amenities and we're excited about that uh, that program you can throw a stone to New Orleans but you didn't need a really good arm but it would uh, basically be there. what about uh, same thing on this Jerry the cities do you think they're gonna have more open space now? Do you think that that's going to become more valuable? I would, I would think so. I, I haven't personally read much on that, but I would think just anecdotally uh, that would certainly be something that, that more and more cities are going to incorporate pocket parks and, and gathering spaces um, because the social distancing, uh, I, I think, is here to stay. And I think people are still inherently, um, they, they want to be hospitable, they want to they wanna gather, but they, they want space to do it safely. And they'll want that for a while, I think. Mm -hmm. and Jerry, that's a very important note you just had there, that even after a vaccine is found, we're not going to live the same way. You I know, agree. This is a life-changing. Uh, and I want to ask all four of you something that I was just uh, kind of holding to the end is, what happens, um, what happens to mass transit and all of this? I know it's been affected very, you know, very deeply by the uh, virus, but uh, what about long-term? I mean, 
is it going to be less attractive? It's one of the things we've been driving for. So uh, maybe I'll start with uh, with Norman on that uh, from the from New Orleans. Interesting point, and I, I will tell you this: we're working on some transit-oriented developments, and I think if mass transit meets a pain point for the community or is solving a problem, it'll be utilized. Um, and, and, I, and I know specifically on how we are laid out, uh, just take New Orleans East for example, for us to bring uh, consumers to New Orleans East or to have a workforce go to downtown, we still need to have that component. Uh, I do think uh, we've talked about a light rail from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and conceptually if you went uh, and continued a light rail through New Orleans, New Orleans East to Slidell, you're seeing a utilization of mass transit in a way that has not been done in this region, but in other regions, it's very much the norm and it solves a problem. So um, I'm still bullish. I, I don't think that mass transit in and of itself is going to take a hit because of consumer changes or we have not structured our infrastructure to bring it full circle that would engage another way that would eliminate or reduce mass transit needs. If that occurred, then yeah, possibly. But I still see an avenue for mass transit going forward. And Chris, you've, um, you know, you see the different, the reason I wanted to throw this one at you is you see across three or four different states, um, are each of the states, um, what is separating them? Are, is it government decisions that are determining how well they're doing or is it is it industries that are driving it? Why are some states doing better than others in that, in that area? In, in, in the geography that we cover, um, <laughs> you know, I, my personal opinion is our tax structure in Louisiana. It makes it more difficult for us. Uh, you know, our net effective tax rate, and Michael Heck with GNO Inc. says this all the time, our net effective tax rate is actually lower than the state of Texas. But people can't figure out the tax code here. So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Rachel. And, you know, the question you had to Rachel is, you know, what happens when the incentive burns off and, you know, why don't people stay? It's just because they can't figure stuff out. Um, you know, physically, the characteristics of our state, we have, we have all the amenities of the world that a business could want. Uh, and when you look at it in relation to, you know, us versus Mississippi or Alabama or even the Florida Panhandle, it's just, it's just understanding the business environment better. And, and frankly, our history is our biggest detriment in some respects. Um, and, and we need to overcome that, that, you know, we need to let people know and we need to have people understand that Louisiana is open for business. Um, you know, with what's coming right now, and, and Jerry touched on this as well, you know, manufacturing, they're decentralizing the manufacturing model across the world um, in order to, to, to not cut down the supply chain like they did with, with this. If, if all your manufacturing is in Asia and you can't get the products here, you know, you're, you're, you're in a lot of trouble if this happens again in the future. So decentralizing that model, having more manufacturing centers, having more points of distribution and more opportunities to, to get those goods and services into the United States through more ports of entry um, is going to be a wave that's going to come. There's going to be a lot of opportunity there for us, I think, with our ports um, in Louisiana to be able to capitalize on some of that, especially in the container business. Um, you know, and we, we kind of talked about this yesterday, some of us that were just having a, another discussion, you know, does it make sense to put a big infrastructure project in place to beef up a port? You know, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis to how much cargo containers are, are going to come into the country? Um, and, you know, that, that still remains to be seen, but I do think that there's a definite benefit for us here. Um, and, and so, you know, if we pitch what we have and we talk about doing business in a different way in the state of Louisiana, not just in the energy sector, I think there's a ton of opportunity here. I really feel that way. So I, that's my hope going forward. And my final question goes to Rachel. Uh, you have done such a good job in a nine parish group getting them together. Uh, how difficult is it? I mean, you know, everybody has their own little fiefdoms and such. Is there a couple of points that made that work? And can the rest of the state kind of uh, use part of that model? Well, I think it's kind of ironic that you asked me that. I was hired by Stephen Moray um, back in 2006. So I have seen, you know, a complete shift in our partnerships um, from day one. 
but you know, we really are there to support our partners. We work with our partners. Um, we're in constant communication. We try to bring them value through bringing them leads, through our, you know, legislative team, through our education team. You know, we try to just be a value provider and asset to all of our regional partners. So we are fortunate that we have a great working relationship. And, you know, I think that comes through at the end of the day when you've got a prospect in town and, you know, you're bringing them to the local person because, look, we all know all economic development is truly local at the end of the day um, and, and they can the prospects and the psych consultants can honestly genuinely feel that partnership so I think you know we've been authentic we've been transparent and you know we just try to continue to, to provide services for things that they might not have you know the resources to have so um, it, it's been a good it's been a great partnership together you're stronger they uh, Rachel I wanted to thank you Rachel uh, Rachel Delamain is uh, from the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. I'd like to also thank uh, Chris Abadie from Sterling Properties, uh, Norman Barnum from the New Orleans Business Alliance, and Jerry Bologna from JEDCO. Uh, this, is, this has really been terrific, and um, maybe we should do this again sometime. Uh, and do you want to take it from here? Maybe there's no. Maybe I'm just, but, this is the part but, where I'm. I don't want this to be our last conversation. You were so entertaining and you're so much fun. Um, you know, so I hope this, this is just the beginning of many. I, I, I hope so too. And I hope everybody enjoyed themselves and uh, well, let's force them to make another one. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Right, thank hey, you thank so you guys. much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.